but did we want to get started by just you know going around introing you three what you do at Loxo and your involvement in the Code Arena audit? Yeah, I see uh, Fabian just to uh, join as you ask a question actually. Perfect. Yes, I'm here. How are you going? Good. Um, yeah, good and busy. <laughs> it's always, <laughs> it's always good time. to be busy. Uh, for nothing. Okay. I was just saying, if we wanted to get started by, you know, going through each of you guys and introducing yourselves, how you're involved with Loxo and how you're involved with the Code Arena audit. Um, sure. Maybe Yaman and John, you you. Hello, can you hear me guys or? Yes. Okay, cool. So yeah, maybe I can start. So hello everyone. My name is uh, Yaman. Um, I have a background in computer and communication networks. And um, for the last two years, I have been working with Luxo, mainly proposing and maintaining standards around like smart contract based accounts, access control, tokens, social recovery, and etc. cetera. And uh, I have been working also with Jean and Maxime and Daniel on the smart contract implementation of these standards which will be audited in this contest. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully the wardens will make this contract more robust and uh, more secure. I will pass it to you, Jean. Cool, thanks, Yamin. So yeah, hi, everyone. So my name is, uh, my name is Jean. I'm a smart contract engineer at Luxo. And um, I've been uh, working, um, yeah, with a, uh, yeah, I'm in Maxim and Daniel on the smart contract team on the, um, the Luxo standard proposal and the implementation in Solidity. And yeah, and I joined basically at uh, um, one month interval uh, than Yemen um, at exactly the almost the same time. Um, so yeah, we joined at roughly the same interval. Um, yeah, and I've been um, before Luxo, I've been uh, working in the past on smart contract for around four years. Uh, before I was more doing that part-time uh, side of uh, my other Web2 job. And yeah, then since uh, Luxo, um, since joining uh, Luxo, uh, and since Fabian and Yep uh, pitched me the idea of uh, Luxo and the, the LSPs, uh, yeah, I've been now full-time working on on the standards and the implementation in Solidity. And yeah, and I'm really excited for the Code for Arena Audit Contest, and I hope uh, that uh, you guys, the world, and will find plenty of uh, things to report. And yeah, and I will leave the mic to Fabian now. Thank you. Um, so I'm the founder, or one of the founders of Luxo. We started out uh, in building and initiating a blockchain for the new creative economies. Um, a blockchain focused more on the rest of the world rather than the Nord world that currently uses blockchain, uh, where in blockchain we have either traders or nerds or, uh, yeah, pretty much that's it. You know, that's what we have. So um, in order to change this and to make, you know, blockchain usable for everyone, we need first use cases that people find attractive. And second, we need the usability that is usable. Um, one of the things and the, thing, the main things that we have been working on the last uh, yeah, three years actually is a new set of smart conduct standards, mainly a smart conduct based account system and a revamp of the token standards that um, basically will change everything the way we interact with blockchain. It, it makes a lot of things possible that were simply impossible or actually like very quirky possible today and uh, this whole journey started out um in with ERC 7 to 5 a standard i proposed back in 2017 i believe um before that i was part of the ethereum foundation um created you know the mist browser the first web3 browser worked on web3 js um made the version that everybody's using still today um the 1.0 um 
and um, yeah, proposed ESC20. So kind of proposed the first smart contract standard. This kicked this whole standardization or smart contract standardization wave. Um, but what happened basically over the last years is that literally everything is somewhat related to ESC20 or trying to be backwards compatible. And that left a lot of innovation uh, out of possibilities, right? Because sometimes you need to break things in order to make them right. Um, and that's what we did with Luxo. Basically, thinking from scratch, what's the right way of building an on-chain account system? And obviously, it must be a smart contract account system because otherwise you don't have an account system. Otherwise, you just have a key. Um, and how should that account system work? And not just thinking about account abstraction and you know gasless transactions, but also thinking about how you manage that account. How can this account react on incoming assets uh, or, or any kind of protocol? Uh, how can it be extended? How can you store information in this account? So all of these things we basically, you know, invented over the last few years, um, specified in standards first, then built implementations, um, and then made a lot of audits. And here we are shortly before release of the, that massive construct of, of modular pieces that people can use to build a a real user experience on blockchain, basically. Amazing. And you kind of touched on it a little bit, but what would you say is the Luxo team's vision for the future? I mean, the vision for Luxo is to create a, or we have created now, no, the people have created a blockchain. The network started uh, <clears throat> May 23rd at 4.20 p.m. UTC. Um, it's currently in what we call the discovery month. Um, basically, uh, people, so we have checked how stable does the network run. We have 10, over 10,000 validator keys that are the Genesis validators that everybody could have become one by sending a Lux to a smart contract on Ethereum a few weeks back. Um, we have done the private sale and advisor payouts, and we are launching the Luxy migration bridge or migration very soon and then it's a go and in about a month time or a bit more we will launch the universal profile stack officially that means a browser extension um smart contracts and everything is already there and hence you know this audit what makes luxo so unique um i think one is the community that's definitely very unique you see all of these guys here probably on the top already here. Uh, we have a very dedicated community. We have a focus on normal users, on applications that not necessarily are financially driven, but they are more social driven. I mean, be it decentralized social media, digital fashion, um, DAOs of all kinds of sorts, basically all the things that normal people also would like to participate in. And the, the, the real gold mag <laughs> that Luxo has are these new core standards. And in fact, uh, we pulled out of the Ethereum request for common space, a word that I defined in 2015, um, because it was actually meant as a request for comment. It was never meant as the final standard standards, right? So we call that a Luxo, Luxo standard proposals, something that I should probably have, <laughs> if I would have known that, have called that Ethereum standard proposals back in the day, but... Um, so we call it uh, Luxo standards proposals, and we do this within the Luxo GitHub in order to have a clean slate and to have a basic set of standards that people will build on. And the most core pieces that everybody builds the DApp on right now is actually basically uh, something, th something with token that means ERC20. So we need to fix the token standards, and we have done that. They're called LSP7 and LSP8. But even more importantly, and that's the piece that's missing in the whole blockchain space, is a proper identity slash account slash profile system. So we have to get away from this notion of wallets, thinking that like you have a wallet and you have your token in a wallet. This is your account. And your account can be a wallet, right? You can hold things with your wallet, uh, with your account, but it can be also so much more. And when we think about so much more, 
that's when it, the real interesting use cases come to mind, like decentralized social media. Like, you know, you can build encrypted chat apps on top of universal profiles. You can build um, a whole social experience, a whole follower system uh, on these accounts. You can build uh, voting systems, you know, real DAOs where you know who are the participants. You might not know the, the real people behind that, but they have faces, they have names. You will recognize them when they do things on other DAOs or different communities. So you start to really be able to gain reputation around your blockchain-based account. Um, and you can have a user experience that's very useful and usable. So the unique thing is the set of standards that you guys will explore and dissect and uh, try to break. <laughs> um, and... Um, unbiased, uh, open, basic account system that's extremely generic and flexible, but at the same time, very versatile. So that would be kind of the easiest way to say. Awesome. And for the for the audit itself, you mentioned that the standards are what you're hoping um, the wardens will pick apart. Is that the entire scope of the audit? Is there more? So, I mean... Um, I'm not sure what exactly was in, internally discussed about the scope of the audit. <laughs> Maybe Jean and Yama can help here, but it's definitely the universal profile smart contracts, but I'm not sure if you included the tokens as well. Yeah, so I can I can answer to that. Um, so basically for the scope of the audit, um, I would say there is um, two big categories really. So there is uh, what Fabian has, um, mentioned about the universal profile stack which is uh, a set of uh, separate contract and contract that are um, inherited and included into the universal profile. So this is basically, um, I think it's six contracts. So there is the uh, LSP0, which uh, is the main smart contract base account used by the universal profile that uh, embeds different uh, uh, module and other standards like LSP1, the universal receiver, LSP14 for the honorable two steps, um, LSP17 for um, the, um, uh, to extend the contract, and LSP20 for um, the core verification. And then alongside this, there is two um, uh, other contracts that are separately deployed. The key manager, which is a permissioning system to uh, basically control universal profile and have give permissions to different accounts to to interact with it to different addresses sorry and then the universal receiver the universal receiver which is another contract to extend the functionality of um, your lsp1 uh, universal receiver function so this is the universal profile stack and then there is the second uh, I think it's good to call it the yeah, stack, is the token uh, stack, the token standards, which are basically um, LSP 7 and 8, which are um, um, like a new generation of token and NFT standards uh, uh, that are a bit different than ERC20 and 7 to 1. And both of these use LSP 4, the digital asset metadata standard under the hood to um, enable the token to store uh, uh, basically, uh, like an unli unlimited amount of um, uh, metadata information into the token contract itself. So yeah, that's the two big categories: the universal profile stack and the token stack. Nice. And on the um, on the standards that you mentioned, how do they differ from ERC twenties and ERC seven two ones? Maybe I can add, uh, jump in here quickly. <clears throat> so ESC20, so basically LSP7 is like ESC20 and LSP8 is like uh, ESC721. They are pretty much the same. So what we mainly did is that we cleaned up the function naming, making them uh, more unified between the two standards because on a token versus an NFT contract, I mean, literally everything is the same except the transfer function. Because once you transfer an amount, which is a number, on the other, you transfer an ID. Mm -hmm. um, another thing we did is we made a generic byte 32 ID. And then there is a, a type for the ID that's written in the, in the contract that you can basically figure out if this is like a, 
a hash or if it's a number of it's whatever you know that the, the token ID represents because there can be different type of you know IDs you might want to use for different kind of NF NFTs and they all are based or they all have included the ERC seven to five Y key value store. That means you can attach unlimited amount of information to the token contract itself. So the to token contract can now have a linked JSON file that has all kinds of you know data like you know more, um, um, uh, websites and whatever data you want to have just describing the token, for example, an icon. Um, but you can also attach any kind of other relevant smart contract readable information. For example, you could reference a protocol that belongs to the token, or you could reference additional data that's somehow related to, to the token or can even incorporate it into a custom version of the token where he acts on certain things. So there's a lot of flexibility how you can build tokens now. So what information you attach, um, but it's in a basic form pretty similar to ERC-20 except naming and one of the big um, changes is that when you're sending a token, this token informs the receiving smart contract using the universal receiver standard, which is LSP1. Uh, universal receiver standard is basically a generic way to call other smart contracts. So think of it like this. If you, ERC20, we haven't built that in at the time. Uh, we had this, discussed this, but it was a bit too far ahead. It was 2015. Um, but ERC-223, to uh, one they all have these kind of custom functions that they're trying to call on receiving contracts. The problem with custom functions is you cannot build a generic wallet or a generic account, right? Because now you need to implement 50 different functions or 50 different standards just so that your you know, account can react on those. So that's what the universal receiver uh, solves. It's a unified function. It's called literally universal receiver. It has a type and has data. So now based on uh, whatever, you know, whatever contract is calling, for example, the LSP7, he will send a certain type of type ID and a certain type of data. And then any kind of universal profile, or any smart contract that implements universal receiver can now react on these incoming assets in whatever shape or form they want. And because this is a unified function, you can build this even in an upgraded form where you can have this universal receiver function be upgradable in some form that you can react even on future assets that are not existing at the time of the deployment of the smart contract. That's specifically important for these universal profiles, right? If you have a smart contract based account, you want this to be long lasting, you want this to be able to interact with future assets as well. That's exactly why your universal receiver function is upgradable through an external contract, which we call a universal receiver delegate, that then can change the behavior on different type of assets that are incoming. So the main thing that changes on, or the main real additions is um, when you're sending a token or an NFT, it informs the sender and it forms the receiver using this universal receiver function. And that's very useful because now you can make things like a DEX being a single transaction and not anymore uh, it is the proof and transfer from flow which have scammed so many people um, it's a way nicer user experience as well um, but you can also build things now where you can reject certain things or reroute the certain uh, tokens automatically that you receive on your account and so on what we also do is because we're ending the paradigm of wallet accounts <laughs> to be bold um, these new token standards um, cannot by default send to an EOA. So you cannot transfer these tokens to an EOA. Um, there is a force parameter in the transfer function where you can force it to be sent to a EOA or to a smart contract that does not um, uh, implement the universal receiver. But the default way is it has to be a smart contract and has to be a smart contract that implements the universal receiver. Otherwise, you cannot send the token to it. And that's for security reason and security by design because what is one of the biggest losses in crypto is people sending stuff to the wrong address right yeah, so when you when you have built it in by design that you can't send it to a wrong address except it's another profile which is unlikely to happen with a typing mistake um you will not lose your things at the same time if you're old school and you want to use metamask you know you can always use the transfer function but then at least you have a warning 
uh, you know, that tells you, hey, you really want to do that? Are you sure what you're doing? And they have to press OK. And then, you know, if they then make mistakes, at least they were warned pretty big time. So it's a, it's a safer standards, you know, safer token standards, more extensible, more flexible, uh, have a lot more possibilities of what you can do with it. Um, there's a lot more details on how you extend them and how you can make NFTs being collections and whatnot. But that's probably a bit too complex. Uh, for for this call here awesome and to i guess return to security more generally i was reading through your white paper and it's, it talks about you know how customer mindsets have shifted and there's heightened demands for convenience transparency ethics usability as well do you think that customers collective attitude towards security has changed I mean, I would say, I mean, when we're talking about the blockchain space, right, I mean, this is inherently, I mean, there's a, I mean, I think people have realized that, you know, uh, if you don't own stuff in the internet, you don't own it. I mean, I, I think, you know, in the early days of the internet, everybody thought, ah, I can just write whatever I want on social media, I can post whatever in forums. Censorship has come, you know, we've realized, okay, it's not always the case, you know, uh, there's more and more things that are restricted or, or, you know, your accounts get shut down or closed. So obviously people realize that they never had control <laughs> over their things. I think that's, that's one thing what people realize. Um, and the other thing is when you own things, you know, physical or digital, you ideally really want to own it. And you ideally didn't want to have landed it, you know, on the goodwill of a, a, of a company that could like cut you out of your own stuff at any point in time. I guess that's one thing. When it comes to security and blockchain, I mean, the problem is that everybody is completely scared of using blockchain. You know? <laughs> so I would say the, the, the attitude to security, you know, was never worse, you know? It was always the same worst kind of, like, scenario. People, like, most people don't use blockchain. Even hardcore developers, even hardcore users, you know, that has been in, have been in the space for years, barely do anything on, on on blockchain why because most of the assets they store in like safe places and they don't want you don't really want to touch it so you have very few users who actually do something and then half of them are even bots and the other half is just, just traders you know either it was a year ago was like nft traders and token traders and whatnot so the problem is because this is also scary, and the, the reason why it's so scary is because we are storing things on a single password that we cannot change, that has no functionality, and that has no ability to store any information. You know, the user experience is just shit. Um, and that creates a blockchain space that has been worth $2 trillion, you know, in 2021, and literally has no users, which is a crazy paradox if you think about it. And the real really answer to that is it has been too scary to use blockchain and too complicated. Too many hoops to jump through, too many horror stories of total loss uh, literally made people not use it. So it's kind of a weird paradox we are in where it's so popular and at the same time so unpopular. Yeah, we're yet to see the, the real growth, I guess. And I guess to talk more about the role Luxo is playing in shaping the stance on security within the wider Web3 ecosystem. What are your, what are your thoughts on how Luxo is going to contribute to that? You've I mean, obviously will, touched on it. Yeah, yeah, sorry, you go. Yeah, I would just uh, tell a few things, but maybe also Jean, yeah, we can say a few more things. But basically, by, by introducing a, a smart contract-based account as the basic tool that you interact with Luxo, and in the future, probably any other blockchain as well, um, because this standard is very like adoptable and flexible and it will be used cross chains in the future, very certainly. Um, we basically allow that you can build now any kind of uh, recover or security or permission systems on top of this account. So your core account, which uh, Jean described being L LSP0, sorry, your, your LSP0 smart contract, that's the thing you can't change, right? That's the thing that stores information, and that's the thing that acts, acts, you know, on other smart contracts. For example, owns tokens, transfers them, you know, votes in a DAO, whatnot. But the way you control it, that's that's done through a key manager, and we have one standard for a key manager. It's called LSP6. It allows you to add a lot of different 
like addresses. You can give them different levels of permission. You can say they can only change certain profile data or they can execute only with certain smart contracts or they can be restricted on what you know low level calls they can do. So there's, there's plenty of things you can change, but you could add any kind of key manager you want. You could add a Gnosis safe, you know, as a key manager, if you will, as a multi-sig in front of your universal profile. And people can now invent really interesting ways of handling and managing your blockchain account. And I think that's when when it gets very interesting because you can build extremely resilient and secure systems this way. Um, for example, we have a social recovery system. Social recovery doesn't even mean that it's only in your friends, right? Social recovery also could mean you take like five internet services. And if you combine these five internet services, they can regain you access back to your account. So you can build now the most interesting ways of how you recover or how you uh, use your account in such a way that it will not feel scary anymore. So I think that's the biggest shift that we will see is that you now have the ability to create true easier than web two user experience by by having the full power of web three. And I think that's kind of what we need to see. And that that's now possible with this system. Yeah, I think I would um, I would add also more on what Fabian said that uh, I think the idea really to um, focus on uh, the standard rather than um, building just a project and contract um, really shifts the idea of the security at a, at a different level. Like for instance, if you look in a on the ERC20 space, there's a lot of token, different token standards. And there are, um, um, if any of you subscribe to the Ethereum, weak news in Ethereum, uh, you constantly see new ERC standards for new token standard. And basically what makes that, that makes that very complicated for application to build the application, like to build really an application that can communicate with a lot of these um, different type of uh, tokens because and, and there is no standard as well for how what you use for interacting with this application then it makes everything very complex there is a lot of complexity and when there is a lot of complexity there is a lot of there's more bugs there's more uh, there's basically more way for uh, hackers and cyber criminals to find exploits and I think really the idea of uh, like so with the standard is uh, really to have these building blocks as we call them that are really standardized robust but flexible enough um, generic enough that you can adapt adapt them for different use cases and um, yeah and the idea is that then if uh, if it's well standardized if it's uh, or if it has been audited reviewed a lot um, then what you need, what you trust at the end, it's not the application that you interacted with; it's the, the actual standard it's, uh, itself. And yeah, and I mean, what I often like to give the analogy with is with uh, e-commerce. You know, when you go to a website, you look at the SSL certificate in your na navigation bar. You see that the connection is encrypted. You you kind of feel secure that you can enter your credit card details. And I think it's a bit the same with uh, the LSP standards. You know, with SSL certificate, you don't need to know how the TLS encryption work. You know that it's a internet standard. It has been, uh, you know, like review. Uh, it has been said, it has been reviewed. And you know that you are using something under the hood you are, that is uh, safe. And yeah, I think it's really the idea of um, really the LSP is the, like with a, smart contract base account, LSP0, um, and all the modules around it, and the token standard. So yeah, I think it's how really, uh, uh, I think uh, with Luxo, we are really um, contributing in terms of uh, security, really to focus on the standardization. I love that analogy. I think that's really useful. To get into specifically the Code Arena audit now, um, I think Fabian mentioned, you know, you've gone through a lot of audits. I think it's seven before, if I'm correct. What made you decide to undergo an additional audit with Code Arena? 
That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, <laughs> this is a good question. I mean, because once you get the business developer on, on getting audits in, then he will not stop. No, I mean, <laughs> um, actually, we had, um, we first started out with the big audit firms. Uh, we did an audit with Quantstamp and and other uh, audit firms, but this was quite unsatisfying in the results. I mean, funny enough, you know, the biggest are actually not the best um, because they're, they're too big of a machine to really pay attention to the details. So we then did audits with um, independent auditors, and these were actually really great. So we have done a row of bigger audits than um, independent auditors. They are even g- gave feedback to standard changes or improvements, smaller things here and there that really like, really even like perfected our crystal, I would call it. Uh, <laughs> and um, and uh, basically this audit now is, we feel confident that the system is secure. We feel confident that it's literally, you know, rock solid. And we have had a lot of eyes and a lot of thought going into this over many years. And, and Code Arena is kind of like a good, it's good like, you know, throw it into the ring. You know, it's like kind of, this kind of the analogy. Throw it into the ring and let uh, lots of different minds like, uh, like look at it and ponder on it and see if they can find something. At the same time, maybe what has to be mentioned, this is, especially the universal profile, right? This is a generic smart contract account system. So, Obviously, because you can do everything, you can literally execute any other contract. There's plenty of possibilities of not necessarily uh, security issues. Um, and I would be very interested if you guys can find any security issue. But there is, there is obviously a possibility for user error, right? I mean, if you have something that can do a lot more, then people can do also a lot more wrong. <laughs> so this is kind of like, you know... The tricky thing, um, and there is some, some I would say, some complex flows that you can now do because you, when you execute, you talk to a key manager. The key manager talks to your, to your uh, account, to your smart contract account, which then talks to external contracts, which then could call back into the key manager if they have permission or not, and this could create very interesting, crazy loops or reactions uh, in some form. So. It's really a, a far more sophisticated way, way of thinking when you think about finding issues and finding vulnerabilities. It's not like that simple, okay, one function, you know, is there a re-entrancy and, you know, is there, when this is stuff is being stored here and there, is there overflow? It's not this kind of simple stuff. You have to think a bit more around the corner to, <laughs> to see if you can find a, a loophole. Um, yeah, and yeah, we hope you guys... We hope we don't find something, but we hope we definitely go close enough to finding something um, or make sure that there is none, right? Um, but lots of AIs has been on this. A lot of uh, thought went into this. And uh, I would be very surprised if you guys would find anything very, very critical. Um, but, you know, that's your chance here. Yeah, for any wardens listening, imagination and creativity sounds like it's going to be key for the audit itself. Um, Jean or Jan, are there, is there any additional context you think would be helpful for the wardens listening? Yeah, I really think for the, I mean, yeah, in terms of like really what the wardens here should be looking at, it's... Um, uh, I think it's really to try to find yeah very these uh, creative ways as men- mentioned by Fabian to interact with the contract like really trying to find ways of if anyone find, like I mean we have been going through like already a lot of audits and we even internally we try to think of a lot of you know like uh, um, the unhappy path. Uh, as we always call it, uh, to interact with a contract. Uh, but yeah, I think really um, the idea of um, trying to interact with a contract in a way is that um, we might not expect or we might not assume is really, it will, I think it's probably the, the thing from my side that I would be very uh, interested in. And, um, and you know that these kind of uh, scenarios and like uh, if it, if it leads to and really unexpected outcomes. Um, I mean, what things that we are expecting, that we 
we mentioned our uh, bypassing permissions, like you don't have a permission, but you can do an interaction that, yeah, that require permission that you don't have, or you can, um, yeah, you can uh, lock the, like, or like blocking the contract. Uh, I mean, um, yeah, I think that's the, this kind of uh, areas. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we went through like already um, a lot of audits, um, I mean, a lot of change. Uh, if you look on the repo in the um, all the release, we um, we had had some very breaking release after the audits where with we a lot of changes. Um, so yeah, I think uh, yeah, that's really what I would uh, really what I would include, encourage. Like um, like really trying to think of what's the box actually, what's the boundaries, because that's what is really hard. Uh, I mean, from my perspective, to to figure out when you we you work on smart contract standards, you you don't know what people are going to build necessarily with it. You you don't know the whole boundaries, and yeah, I think that's probably my uh, my way to to think of it. Yeah, for the context. And maybe to, to add on what John is saying, um, so it's important to know how these contracts work independently. So as a universal profile, how it's a generic executor that can execute any other stuff. But it's also important to know how it works with other contracts that we have in the scope, such as the key manager, which will be an owner, and the universal receiver delegate which will be a contract that reacts on every call to the universal receiver. So it's important to know also the architecture of these contracts, how like they will be deployed and set up on the mainnet. It's important to know like which contract will talk to the other and which contract will act as a singleton on the network and granted some permissions for all the universal profile. Like it's, it's mentioned in the additional context on the repo, but uh, yeah, as a tip, it's it's very important to know all the architecture, how things talk together. And uh, yeah, we will be available on the Discord. We have documentation, you can ask questions. And if you feel that something is not like really clear, we are happy to answer the questions. Yeah, maybe also there's a good point here to, to point to the docs. So docs.luxo.tech. Um, is kind of the Bible of the standards. So there's three layers of information. Docs.luxo.tech, if you click on standards, it has sections that kind of high level describe how these standards work and also how they work together with nice graphics and everything. Then there's the actual standards documentation that's always linked in the top. It's the LSP. Um, that is kind of the, the clear specification of what you know the smart contract does. Um, and then there is the... Um, the smart contract implementations uh, documentation that explain the functions and how they look like and so on. That's also explained in the standard, but here it's explained a bit more technical. And then obviously that's the code. Um, I think that will help. I mean, obviously we are working on this since a while. So our documentation, we try to make it as understandable as possible, but we are also into source pretty deep. So, so maybe we're missing some introductionary sentences I just realized this today, you know, when I got this question, hey, the LSP2, um, is this like, uh, is this a, a specific type of smart contract or not? You know, it's not. It actually describes how your key value is, in, is in, encoded and decoded. And maybe sometimes you're missing maybe the, the simpler view, you know, and having the simple description gives you the first intro to things. Um, so if you have also suggestions towards the documentation, uh, I think we have in our Discord a document documentation a documentation um, channel, a public one, where you can uh, suggest improvements on the docs. Um, I mean, it's kind of a bible, so take a look at take a look at the new the new bible of block, blockchain account standard, the blockchain account standard, and uh, dig deep uh, and help us improve it. Yeah, for any wardens listening, you've got three days to study up on all those docs before the audit kicks off so don't waste your time i guess to to wrap up were there any kind of final comments or tips that you wanted to pass on to the code arena auditors yeah so i will say um on on the code for arena repo um 
to bounce back on what Fabien was saying, uh, we you will see the, at the top overview section. Uh, so we built a, a table with Daniel with that links for each um, LSP to the um, actual uh, standard, the specification, and and the um, the standard explanation on the on the docs. So like the high level overview and the more formal specification. Um, so you can use this table uh, really to uh, jump into uh, each specific category to uh, and each uh, um, documentation for each standard to really um, uh, look for it. Yeah. So yeah, I thought it was good to, to mention that. Definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. And I think the, I know actually the wardens really appreciate it as well. So we will let you go and we will see everyone in the arena in a couple of days. Awesome. Thank you so much for everyone watching and looking into this in depth. We are really looking forward to your uh, feedback. Um, we truly believe that these standards will be uh, extremely beneficial to the whole blockchain space at large, that eventually probably this will be the default account system that everybody's using across every EVM chain and beyond. Um, yeah, so take your time and look deep. <laughs> <laughs> and ask uh, plenty of questions as well. Like reach out to us on Discord, on Twitter. Um, Whichever way, like, do not hesitate really to ask uh, plenty of questions um, during the course of the, the audit. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.